Hi and welcome back to the Bordeaux Masterclass course and in this module we're going to be looking at the trade of Bordeaux wines, the Bordeaux wine trade, how it works and that how, how that all affects the prices of Bordeaux, how you as a customer can buy Bordeaux, what Bordeaux to buy. Uh, so this is pretty much the trade and the buying of Bordeaux wines module. It's our final module and we're going to dive straight into it with how does the Bordeaux wine trade works because it doesn't really work like any other wine region in the world. It has its own set of rules, its own marketplace and I'm going to explain to you a little bit how everything fits together and how everything works. The Bordeaux wine trade is made up of many actors. On one side, we have the producers, the people who grow the grapes, uh, mature the grapes, and, on, and sometimes uh, produce the wine, uh, but not always. Most times produce the wines, but not always. And on the other side, we have the consumer. And in the middle between these two, we have a lot of different actors. Together, these actors in Bordeaux are called La Place. Uh, they're made up of négociants, cooperatives and brokers, courtiers, and they're responsible for uh, the marketing and the uh, commercialization of Bordeaux wine. So how does it work down on the ground? So as I said, on one side, we have the wine producers. Now, these producers, can, but not always, produce the final wine. 60% of producers in Bordeaux are going to produce their own wine. They're going to have their own cellar, they're going to have their own wine-making facilities, but not all. That, rem that leaves 40% of growers who are going to grow grapes, mm, uh, uh, sometimes uh, sell the grapes as is, sometimes they're going to crush the wine and they're going to then sell those grapes to other possible actors. And the actors at this level are going to be two possibilities. Number one, it's going to be a cooperative or number two, it's going to be a négociant. We're going to start with the cooperative first. I don't know if you're, if you're familiar with the cooperative system in wine, the cooperative system is that you join a groupment, a cooperative of wine growers, and you there is a body that's going to be in charge of uh, making the wines, all the technical side of the wines, the, the, a body that's going to help you during the, pr the, the growing of the grapes and is going to um, make the wines and then commercialize them uh, moving forward to the négociants or uh, to the market, but we'll talk about that in just one minute. So the cooperative is there to help smaller growers who don't have the means to have uh, winemaking facilities. A cellar is extremely expensive. The equipment that's needed is very exp expensive. So not all growers have access to finance, to money, to be able to turn their grapes into wine. So they're going to work with, with cooperatives. The other possibility is that they work with uh, négociants, although that's much, much rarer now. Négociants come in on another part of the chain of the market, and I'm going to talk about that in just one second. So the estate, we're going to talk about the 60% who produce their wine. These 60% are going to vinify the wine, turn the grapes into a wine, now they need to sell it. The tradition in Bordeaux is to sell via négociants. So the négociants, wine merchants, are going to be in charge of selling your wine. You, as a, <coughs> as a chateau, would most often not be selling your wine directly, you're going to be working via négociants. If you want to work directly, you still, you, you'd still work as a, with, through a négociant. 
So between you and the négociant, there is another player. Between you and the wine merchant, there is another player called the courtier, the broker. Now the broker's job is to help you make the very best possible wine to accompany you during the all, really all, all the way from the wine growing to the wine making to make sure you produce the, the very best possible wine and his job is then going to be to sell it to the négociants, to the wine merchants who will then sell it on. They're the ones with access to the world market. They're the ones who have access to all the French supermarket chains. They're the ones who have access to very many other wholesalers who are going to sell to restaurants. So you go via the négociant and between the négociant, uh, between the négociant and the grower, there is the broker. His job is basically to ensure uh, he's the middleman, he's the supply man between the production and the commercialization and he earns 2% of all the wines that go from the growers to the uh, négociants. That wine can be a Finnish bottled wine or it can be a finished bottled wine, uh, um, a wine that is a liquid. In liquid, it's not bottled and it's going to be sold to the négociant. There are two types of négociant or two main activities of a négociant. The first one is to buy bottles, as I explained in the first case, and sell them on internationally and nationally in France. The second job is to have wines that they buy in what we call bulk, in, as a liquid, as they, they buy large quantities of wine as a liquid, and then they are going to sometimes age the wine, they're going to blend those wines together from the different purchases that they've made all over, and they're going to uh, have a, a, another product, a branded product most of the time, that they're going to sell on. So our négociant éleveur are mainly going to be big players who have big firepower within the international markets and within the national market and they're going to create large uh, powerful wine brands uh, which are made up of a blend of different wines from all over the place enough to create a large volume uh, so as to satisfy the demand when you start working with supermarkets with um, these large players, you're going to need large volumes of wine uh, and therefore they, they, they need to have lots of different sources of uh, supply and blend them together into a wine and create this, this uh, a big brand that they're going to sell. We're going to look uh, however, at the more qualitative side, I'm not saying that the wines, the, the brands are poor quality wines, but more often they're not. They're not good quality wines. It's very hard to produce wine year in, year out in large volumes and have quality at the same time. It's just the very same way. It's hard. It, it would be hard <clears throat> as a restaurateur to to serve you know 2000 dishes uh every day and expect that those dishes are going to be the the of of any kind of serious quality so we're going to talk about the serious quality because that's where it's really interesting now these négociants now have the finished products they can decide to sell them to straight to the uh, end consumer, but very rarely do they do that. They will then sell it on to wholesalers or importers all over the world. And these importer agents, wholesalers, will then sell the wine on to either another wholesaler or to a shop or to a restaurant. And then you, the consumer, get access to that wine. So as you can see, there's a lot of middlemen but it can get even more difficult with Bordeaux because the demand for some of these wines is so extreme that, and, and the, the, 
the all the all if you wish all the wines well, all the chateau's production is not given to a single négociant but it's given on allocation to a few négociants say négociant A is going to get uh, 2000 bottles négociant B is going to get another 2000 bottles and négociant C is going to get another 2000 bottles if you have a 6000 bottle production you're creating a brand, you want that brand to be present in the right places. If Négociant B has been very, um, how would I say, hasn't been very good with the way he's marketed your wines, if he went and sold it to cheap supermarkets or very dodgy places, which then went to sell it on at uh, bad, at low prices, you would go and, and see Négociant B and say to him, you know, unfortunately, I'm going to reduce your allocation. You're only going to get 1,000 bottles next year. Show me that you can put it in the right places and I'll be giving 500 bottles to the other two Négociants. Now, Négociant B is going to be in need of those missing 1,000 bottles. So he's going to buy them probably from Négociant C and Négociant A at a more expensive price and then sell it on at a more expensive price. Or uh, there is also Négociant EFG that need the wine. So as you can see, it adds layers into, uh, the, into the trade, into that, into that middle um, uh, market where there's so many different actors. So it could be that producer, uh, sells his wine to Négociant B and C. Uh, broker makes 2% commission on that sale. Négociant B and C have all the wines, but Négociant A and D want the wine. They sell it to Négociant A and D, and then you have Négociant Z, X and Y who also need the wine. They're going to buy it from Négociants A and D. As you can see, it all gets complicated. There's very many actors, very many middlemen in this trade. And as a result, this has an impact on, on the different types of pricing you can get. Now with Bordeaux, there are two types or two reasons why people buy Bordeaux. The first one uh, is for consumption, like most of the wines on, on the planet, uh, wine is bought to be consumed. But with Bordeaux, uh, we have investment, which has become very much a part of the scene and a growing part of the Bordeaux scene for the very top wines for the last 35 years. Now, we're going to talk about that, how to buy wine for an investment, how it all works, and then we'll talk about the, the wine for consumption. Now, I told you uh, that the négociants were there to help sell the wine to, uh, for, the, for, the, for the chateaus to the final consumer. In the Second World War, um, chateaus were, were, and after, early after the Second World War, chateaus were having difficulty selling their wine. It wasn't as it is now where there's huge demand worldwide for top Bordeaux wines. This wasn't the case really after the, the Second World War. These chateaus were run as very much as agricultural uh, entities and with, with people having very little knowledge of commerce, of business. And they were helped by the négociants. At that time, the négociants really took their place. But there was a phenomenon that arrived at that time was that um, as I've explained, the, the wines of Bordeaux are going to be kept in barrels for a year or two years. As you can imagine, that year or two years production is going to have a big impact on your cash flow, on the, the amount of money that's left sitting there. You can imagine it's uh, going to be uh, January, uh, you start working, you have people working for you, you have to pay those people, you have a seller, you're going to have to pay for that. You're going to work, have equipment and what have you for until the month of September. September you're going to employ a whole bunch of people who are going to help you grow, uh, pick the grapes, 
you're then going to be working in the cellar. You turn the wine, the, the grapes into a wine. And then from December, January, February, March, that wine is going to be sitting there for a year, two years, three years. And you are not going to be getting paid for basically for two, three years. So the négociants came up with a system to help the chateaux who had cash flow problems. They came up with a system saying, you know what we're going to do? We're going to pay you up front for, uh, for your wines. We realize that a wine barrel is worth an enormous amount of money. Today, a wine barrel is often over a thousand euros per wine barrel. That's an enormous amount of money that's sitting there in your cellar. So, the, the négociant said, listen, we're going to help you out. We realize this is a big cash flow problem. They wanted to access to that wines. We're going to buy your wines today, um, you know, but if, before it's even bottled. We'll, we'll buy it early, uh, but we'll give you a discounted price for it. And at that time, it really did help the chateaus out. And it was a system that grew and grew in the 70s. It was a system that was, that was becoming very common uh, amongst uh, the top end Bordeaux because the top end Bordeaux had more cash flow problems. It's more expensive to make top wine. You use brand new barrels as opposed to second or third year uh, production barrels. You, there, there are a whole bunch of reasons why uh, these top chateaus were in need of cash flow solutions. And then in early uh, 1980s, it became the way top Bordeaux was traded uh, and was, uh, was bought. And this is the way most of the big, uh, the, the, the cru are bought today. They're bought in a system called en primeur. So if you've heard of en primeur, it's when négociants buy the wine, uh, originally bought the wine, up front, sometimes when it, 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 it even wasn't picked yet, uh, but at least uh, uh, most of the time it's going to be in barrels, so they have the time to taste it, to evaluate the quality. Other times uh, it was earlier than that, but basically as it goes into a barrel, you evaluate the quality and the négociants bought those wines and would then sell them on. You as a consumer, had the opportunity to buy that wine at a discount if you were buying it very early, so a year and a half before release, a year before release. That's basically the imprimeur system, a system that was developed by the négos of Bordeaux, the négociant, the wine merchants of Bordeaux, and that has uh, become uh, a phenomenon in other wine regions in the world today.